I first met her while I was hiking to observe alpine plants, halfway along the descent route towards the cabin where I was planning to stay overnight. She was crouched at the side of the trail, looking unwell. She appeared to be in her late thirties, and she was radiant yet somber, a young widow. Again this week, seriously, my name is James, but around here, they call me Michael Thompson. I work as a researcher of alpine plants at the County Museum. For four weeks in a row, when I told my wife, Michelle, that I was going alone to the mountains to observe alpine plants over the weekend, she'd reacted hysterically. It's part of my job, Michelle, there's nothing I can do about it. Back in college, I was part of the athletic club and was invited to go hiking by a senior member. The first mountain I climbed was about 6,500 feet high. I was captivated by a small wildflower known as the queen of alpine plants that I saw at the summit of that mountain. I was fascinated by the small wildflower that had white and pink petals blooming on the rocky ground. Since then, mountain climbing became my hobby, and this passion led me to my job as a researcher of alpine plants. What do you say to Jacob? Jacob is our six-year-old son. Michelle said that I will take him to the amusement park this weekend, as I've been postponing our promise to him. Why don't you just take him, Michelle? You're the one who told Jacob about the amusement park without asking me. Leaving those words behind, I left the house with my backpack. I planned to stay overnight at the mountain cabin, and I had already submitted my climbing plan. I would get to the trailhead by transferring between trains and buses. Is this what they call going through a rough patch? On my way, I recalled the argument with Michelle. It left a sour taste in my mouth. I arrived at the trailhead just after 9 a.m. While climbing towards the summit, I observed alpine plants. It was just after 3 p.m. On my way to the mountain lodge where I'd reserved a one-night stay, I ran into a woman who was sick. I escorted her back to the lodge and nursed her back to health overnight. After regaining her strength, we parted ways at the trailhead the next day. On a whim, I stopped by a local shop at the foot of the mountain and bought a souvenir, candies, for my wife and son for the first time. What's this? When I handed over the mountain treats, my wife, Michelle, looked at me in confusion. I called out to Jacob, who was in his room, telling him I'd brought back a souvenir. Having had his promise of a trip to the amusement park broken, Jacob, sulking, deliberately stomped his feet as he came over. Hoisting Jacob onto Miney, I told him, I swear I'll take you to the amusement park next weekend, for real this time. Really, really? Jacob asked, looking up at me. I'm not lying. Then, I opened the box of souvenir candies. Just as Jacob reached out his hand, Michelle interjected. No, you can't. Dinner is almost ready. After dinner, Jacob and I spent a short hour playing video games, took a bath together, and I put him to bed. When I returned to the living room, Michelle was watching the news on TV, seemingly bored. How about it, want a beer? I took a can of beer out of the fridge and offered it to my wife. What's gotten into you? Playing the doting dad all of a sudden, and now trying to be the loving husband. I grabbed two glasses and sat down across from my wife. Pouring the beer, I raised my glass for a toast. There's something I want to tell you. Something I need you to hear. Michelle took a sip of her beer and looked at me. I told her about the woman I met on the way to the mountain lodge, who was in po health. I thought to myself, she's taking the mountain too lightly, dressed in casual clothes like that. But I couldn't just leave her there. So, I talked to the woman. Whether she was on a tour or lost from her group, she only replied that she came alone. I didn't tell Michelle this, 
but I was reminded of the look on that woman's face when she looked up at me after answering my questions. With her glossy hair tied back and a certain melancholy in her eyes, I was captivated by her. And then I had a thought. Alpine plants possess a unique beauty. The higher the altitude they inhabit, the more I perceive their beauty to intensify. I've wondered why this is, especially considering the harsh natural conditions of these high altitude areas. After all, plants such as flowers perpetuate life by enabling the pollen from male flowers to fertilize the female flowers. This process necessitates the assistance of wind and insects. Wind is a force we can only leave to nature, but insects we can attract. Hence, flowers bloom. The fragrance and beauty of the bloomed flowers serve to attract insects, enlisting them in the process of pollination. I sensed something similar in her, the woman I encountered on my descent route an allure that draws men towards her unconditionally. She said climbing in such light attire and getting sick, it's a nuisance, really, causing such a commotion. It's totally true. I considered taking her to the mountain cabin where I was supposed to stay. However, it was nearly an hour's walk from where I found her to the cabin, even just for me alone. So, what did you do? My wife asked with keen interest. Well, I recalled that there was a refuge cabin much closer, I replied. A refuge cabin is a mountain hut available for free to anyone encountering an emergency, such as bad weather. Most refuge cabins are unmanned, with no resident caretakers. And because they are free, some climbers use them as planned accommodation even when it's not an emergency, which is allowed. I continued my story to my wife. Carrying the woman I'd found on the mountain trail, I walked for about 20 minutes and arrived at the refuge cabin. Along the way, the sky had turned ominous, the wind was picking up, and large raindrops began to fall. The cabin was empty. Well, looks like we're imposing ourselves here tonight. She nodded, arms wrapped around herself. Looking at her, I saw her lips trembling, tinged with purple. Cold, isn't it? That's what happens when you climb a mountain rest like that. I offered her my mountain jacket that I was wearing. When you go mountain climbing, it's basic to layer your clothing. That way, if it's hot, you can take layers off. If it's cold, you can put them on. Even when I tried to explain the basics of mountain climbing, she was miles away. Then I contacted the mountain hut I had booked, explained the situation, and said we would be staying in the emergency shelter that night. So what? You're telling me you two were alone together until morning? Silently, I nodded in response to my wife's question. Huh? And then? My wife, Michelle, spat out the words dismissively. I had brought food, drinks, and cooking utensils to the mountain hut we had booked because we planned to stay without meals. It was a bit scarce for two people, but I cooked dinner anyway. The menu was a classic instant curry. Still cold, I asked her, even though she didn't touch the curry I had made. As usual, she completely ignored me. Gradually, I began to feel irritated. Eat. If you eat, your body will warm up a bit. I don't want it. I thought she was finally reacting, but this was all she said. Still, her gloomy tone made me feel something was seriously wrong. I don't know what happened, but I sternly said to her, if I hadn't come by, your life might have been in danger. You shouldn't underestimate the mountains. But she just turned her sorrowful profile away from me and remained silent, not trying to speak. I thought I couldn't handle this anymore, so I figured all I could do was let her sleep. Did she not touch it after all? The curry you made? Yeah, she didn't eat it, I told my wife, as I grabbed another can of beer from the fridge. 
As night fell, the rain and wind became stronger. The sound of rain hitting the windows was loud, and drafts blew in from various spots of the hut. Why looking out the window, I asked. How do you feel? Has it improved a little? I thought she wouldn't respond, but then I heard her voice, as thin as a mosquito's. If I lie down like this, by morning, I might. Surprised, I turned to look at her. She was wrapped in the mountain jacket I had lent her, covering herself from head to toe. Once again, I turned my gaze back to the window. Then I muttered, It feels like I'm stranded in the middle of a storm. Suddenly, I heard the sound of the mountain jacket rustling. I looked at her. She was sitting half upright, staring straight ahead, frozen in place. Oh, a storm, really, not at all on the side. My wife chimed in. Guess so, they're just the mountains. I answered, and my wife urged me to continue the story with a so. Afterwards, I got into my sleeping bag, but I was having a hard time falling asleep. Then, she who was asleep screamed and jumped up, looking utterly lost. Thinking she might have had a nightmare, I crawled out of my sleeping bag and shook her shoulder. Her body was ice cold. This jacket alone isn't enough. Hey, you're cold, right? She gave a small nod and looked at the sleeping bag I had been using. Can I get in there? I laid the sleeping bag beside her. Come on, get inside. She got into the sleeping bag as I told her, her body shaking from the cold. I thought there was nothing else I could do but warm her up. My sleeping bag was not the mummy type that people usually imagine, but the envelope type that's like a blanket folded in half lengthwise. If I left the zipper open, it would somehow accommodate too. I got into the sleeping bag with her. I'm pretty big body-wise. I hung half my body out of the sleeping bag and moved closer to her. She also snuggled up to me. It's warm. My wife, Michelle, slammed her beer-filled glass onto the table. With that force, the beer splashed out. What? With a woman you barely know, you're telling me you spent the night with her? Yeah. My wife, Michelle, filled with jealousy, trembling with rage, glared at me. Easy there, she's practically sick, don't jump to conclusions. Even as I said this to my wife, I remembered the words of the woman that had made my heart skip a beat. Warm, come closer, she began to speak softly as she nestled up to me in the sleeping bag. She had lost her husband in a mountain accident that had occurred on this mountain about half a year ago. She didn't know what to do next and, in despair and pessimism about her future, she decided to enter the mountain to follow her husband's footsteps and take her own life. But I couldn't do it. I don't have the courage to live on, but I also didn't have the courage to end it here. As she buried her face in my shoulder, I told her, Your late husband is probably saying it's too early for you to join him. That's what I believe. Am I see? Michelle grabbed a tissue and started cleaning up the spilled beer on the table. I recalled the woman who had cried incessantly in my arms. The sensation of her body as she gradually regained her body heat. But are you sure that's all there was to it? Michelle asked, peering into my face. I said don't overthink it. Seeing my unsettled reaction, Michelle flashed a mischievous smile. She then headed to the fridge to get another beer and said, You know what they say about men. When they have something to feel guilty about, they suddenly become nice. She said that my uncharacteristic actions, like buying souvenirs from the mountain I never bought before or becoming a suddenly understanding father, were evidence of my guilt. As she said this, Michelle poured beer into my glass. She then smiled sweetly at me. It seemed that Emily's mood had improved. You know, I spent the night thinking about this with her. What would happen to you and our son 
if I had an accident on the mountain. Stop it, don't even joke about such a thing, but it wasn't a joke or a lie. I had spent the night with her, seriously considering what would happen to my wife, Michelle, and our son, Tyler, if something happened to me. What if I go first? Would my wife and son even shed a tear for a man like me, a husband like this, a father like this? I pondered. That's why I decided to change my ways. I wonder how long that'll last, was my wife's skeptical response. The next weekend, I finally fulfilled my promise to my son to take him to the amusement park. I also cut down on my hiking trips. Then, several months later, one evening after dinner, as I was playing games with my son in the living room, my wife, having finished the dishes, suggested, Hey, next time you go hiking, can Sean and I come with you? Hup, I mean, yeah, sure. Beside me, Sean started making a fuss about how he wanted to go. Why didn't I think of that before? I was at a loss for words. All right, let's go. For this trip, I chose a beginner's trail and took my wife and son hiking. At one point on the trail, my wife stumbled over a rock and lost her balance. I caught her and she buried her face in my chest, exclaiming, this is quite tough. While I held her like that, Shanti's daw, you to our soul of Edivy. We quickly let go of each other. We're almost at a rest cabin. Let's take a break there. The cabin was manned with a toilet and a shop. There were a few other hikers resting there. As I walked towards an open seat with my wife and son, I stopped dead in my tracks when I noticed a woman among the other hikers. My wife asked what was wrong. It's her, the woman I told you about. Wait, is she? The one you shared a sleeping bag with. I found myself nodding before I tapped my wife's forehead with my index finger. She chuckled and followed my gaze to the woman. She, too, noticed us. She quickly stood up and bowed her head towards me. And then she noticed us, too. She quickly stood up and bowed her head toward me. Then, she spoke to the man sitting next to her. After which, that man stood up, looked at me, and walked over. I'm her brother-in-law. Her husband, my younger brother, died. I wanted to thank you for the help you gave my sister-in-law at that time. I was urged by him to step outside. Meanwhile, she approached my wife, and they sat down together. According to her brother-in-law, they had just marked the first anniversary of her husband's death. They took that opportunity to visit this mountain, the site of the accident, to pay their respects. Since my brother passed away, she had been withdrawn. My wife and I were concerned, but he never anticipated she would be so desperate as to think of following her late husband. If it weren't for your help, I might have lost her, too. With that, he deeply bowed his head to me. After descending the mountain and getting on the return train, Sean, exhausted from the climb, fell fast asleep. What did you talk about with her? I asked my wife as I stroked Sean's head. Just a normal chat between two women. So what did you talk about? My wife sang a little tune, teasing me. I wondered if she had questioned her about that night at the shelter. Of course, I had nothing to feel guilty about. But I was curious. Hey, tell me. Do you really want to know? My wife grinned at me. Then she spoke. She said you blushed, even at your age, when she asked you to come closer. I remembered that moment, and with no words to return, I just averted my gaze. She apologized for making such a shameless request. She said you were as nervous as a high schooler. My wife laughed out loud at that. I ended up laughing along with her. Our laughter woke up Sean, our son. Sorry for waking you, buddy. You can go back to sleep. You're not cold, are you? 
I said to him, and my thoughts drifted to her. Just like an alpine flower, you are beautiful. Surely you'll have wonderful encounters ahead. I wish you all the best, just like us, right now. I hope you enjoyed this. Your subscription to our channel really motivates us to create more content. See you in the next video.